Go ahead. Today is November 15th, and we are interviewing World War II vet Gerald Smith. I'm Dave Rivera. This is my partner, Brian. I'll be doing the camera work. Um, if you could state your full name. H. Gerald Smith. And date of birth? Uh, January 25th, 1926. Um, place of birth? Rome. And uh, what branch of the service were you on? Uh, United States Amphibious Forces. Naval Amphibious Forces. Okay. Um, what were the dates of your service? Uh, that's a good question. Uh, January 25th, 1944, to, to uh, May, and I'm not sure the day, of uh, 46, after the war was over. And uh, what was the theater of your service? The what? The theater of your service. Uh, European theater and uh, American theater. Okay. That's just some. Okay, um, what date did you enter the Navy and for what reason did you? Well, for patriotic reasons, more than anything, the country was very much polarized at that time. We were fighting a very defined enemy, contrary to what we are today. And uh, this is what I wanted to do. And I dropped out of the school and went into uh, the Navy in, on January 25th. I think it was uh, on my birthday, 17, or 18th birthday in 19... Uh, Forty-four. Um, where did you receive your training? Uh, Ted, my basic training was in Sampson Naval uh, Base over on uh, Seneca Lake. Okay. Um, and what were your experiences with your training? Like, what did they teach you? What was it like? Well, it was in January. It was very rough. Uh, the weather was very rough and I developed pneumonia toward the end of the, my service there and ended up in the hospital for 18 days until uh, the time that I completed my boot camp and then had my uh, leave at home. Um, what were your duties as a naval officer? I was not an officer. Oh. I was a seaman. Uh, what were your duties? I was, uh, I was actually, I was, you mean aboard ship at the time? Is that what yeah. you're talking about? Aboard ship, I was, went aboard as a gunner, specifically for the invasion of Normandy. Alright. Now, uh, was that your first battle you were in, in Normandy? Oh, first, like, were you there? That, uh, the ship was, but, uh, of course, I was pretty young at the time. I mean, it, uh, 18 was first draftable age. And I did, uh, uh, so consequently it was the only one, because that was the final one there. And then we were, came back to the uh, States in May of uh, 95, after, just before Germany capitulated. And we were waiting for the ship to be refurbished for the invasion of the home islands of Japan. Of course, that all ended when they dropped the bomb and things were over with there, you know. So, well... Did you have any experiences in battle? I was at the uh, Omaha Beach on D-Day. What was that like? Uh, I think most people got a pretty good idea what that was like. It's, uh, it was an extremely large operation, and contrary to what most people think of the veterans, that we had a we were pervy to everything that was going on. Actually, when you're in a combat situation, you're only aware of maybe what you would have in this room, just what your specific job was at that time. Uh, they speak about heroes. There's, there's no heroes. You're just a. I, I, I'll, 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 uh, I'll uh, give you a little disclaimer on there are heroes, but heroes are something that happen when you don't even realize uh, they're going to be heroes. Actually, what happens is, and I was probably about how old are you? I'm 17. You're 17. Well, actually, I went in when I was 17. So you can you can see what the situation was. Went through boot camp, which is a very traumatic experience for someone that's lived in their in their uh, home and sheltered by their family. And you go in and really people you're there and they care about you to a degree, but you you have you don't have the support you would have in a family. 
So once you get into these situations, you take care of yourself. You have your buddies, but normally you take care of your, yourself. So, I don't mean that in a selfish way. I mean, you do your job, but you actually you're, you're on your own, and you, you learn very quickly that uh, you aren't the uh, big fish in the little pool. You're the little fish in the big pool. Okay? Uh, now, what was the question? Oh, um, <laughs> <laughs> what was it like being in battle? Well, the night before, we were briefed in the uh, on board ship, and they weren't giving us very good odds because we were in the initial landing. I was on an LST, I don't think you asked me that question, which is a, a landing ship tank. And our job was to take the, uh, the artillery support, uh, the heavy equipment in. And uh, we had on, I, I want to get ahead of myself here, but the night before they, they gave us a briefing and they said that we'll, we're expecting 70% uh, casualties for the initial assault. Mm -hmm. So that wasn't very good. That gives you a 30% chance of not coming back. But being uh, 18 years old at the time, it didn't seem to make much of an impact. You, you live from day to day, you do your job. But we, as we were going over uh, the night before, it, it, was, it was amazing the number of ships that we encountered. Um, in, in the convoys going across. There was about 5,000 ships in, in, a, in a, about a 125-mile uh, line that went, went across from, from southern England to, to the Normandy beachheads. So there was all kinds. There was battleships, and then they had, I don't know whether, how much research you've done as far as the things on the beach, and they had what they called the, the bamberries that were the artificial harbors, and they were huge uh, concrete things that come across. They look like a, a huge fort coming across, pulling them across the channel. So we, as we were out there, we were just part of a, a huge operation. We knew that. Uh, fortunately, when we got to the beach, or well, we, well, we got within, and it, it indicates on the, on the uh, log, ship's log there, that we had these 13 ducks aboard at the time. A duck is an amphibious truck. You know what they are, a DKW? Mm -hmm. They're, a, oh, I forget the actual weight, probably around the size of a little bigger than a two-and-a-half ton army truck, but they're amphibious. They float and they go under their own power. On each one of these uh, ducks, there was a 105 howitzer. So we had, there was 12 howitzers and one, one um, duck that was the, the command duck that was the headquarters. There was 11 artillery men on each one of these uh, ducks to, to man the guns, besides the crew to drive and maintain the, the vehicle. Well, we, we went in, I, I forget the exact time, it was very early in the morning, around 3 o'clock maybe. They were to, we were to run them off the ramp, and they were to get into battle formation and go in at a specific time. And as, as they went in, they would be bringing up the heavy artillery right after the infantry. So they went, uh, we opened up the bow doors, and as you know, there was a very bad storm there at the time, and, and the waves were running five feet or better. So as we, as these ducks started going off, the first one went off, and uh, he didn't get probably 30 feet from the ship, and he sunk. Uh, apparently, the problem with the, the ducks were, well, I'm still getting ahead of my story. Then the second one went off, that one out, that one went down. Uh, I saw probably, from my vantage point, because it was night, but you know, you can see pretty well at that time of year because it's, uh, you're pretty far north and it's, it's uh, light quite early in the morning. And uh, there was all these men, there was 11 men in the water, they were all hollering for help, which we couldn't do a lot for them. They were uh, all with field packs and things, they were, had a, a conventional type light preserver that you squeezed and it blew up by itself. Well, with your field pack on, your, your um, weight would be on the top. So consequently, many of these people rotated in the water so that just their feet is up instead of their head. Now this, this was uh, with the ducks and with, the, with this equipment, I think there was a lack of planning maybe that should have been done there. I think that was one of your questions. What, how did the equipment work that, that you had for me? Well, in this case, um, these ducks were in water that were, was too rough for them. 
I understand afterwards in some of my research is that they were sandbagged in the bottom of these vehicles. So when they come up on the beach, if they hit a mine, they would be protected from the bottom. But this here, the sandbags, when the water came over because of the rough sea, it, the sand leached out of the sandbags and into the bilge pumps. And uh, that actually was what uh, took place there. I have a complete, I found this book that I was showing you downstairs there that has a complete record of what happened to all of those. There was only one of those howitzers that reached the beach that day and that was after uh, they had gone through all of these, many, many people died in this situation. And they, they came to one of what they call these rhino ferries and they, they just hoisted it on but it never got into action on, uh, on the D-Day, the invasion. And this was one of the reasons that the infantry had such a hard time because they didn't have the heavy artillery support that they should have had from this particular battery, from my, my uh, uh, purview or per, per, parameters that I was watching this from. We also, uh, fortunately, we didn't have to beach on that day. We uh, had these, we had towed this rhino ferry over. A rhino ferry is a huge float with huge outboard motors on it. And you could unload, you could unload 30 tanks onto this rhino ferry. It was, it was so huge. And what they did, we, we, it was so rough, we, had, we, had, we were supposed to mate it, or, or call it, they called it a marriage, to bring this rhino up to our, our ramp and then run the vehicles onto this. Well, it took three tries to do this. And so this got us pretty well through the day into the later afternoon. Fortunately, we were far enough out that we were not under any artillery fire out there. Uh, actually, uh, my actual combat experiences were more in the follow-up action where we made 68 uh, crossings of the channel after the initial uh, assault. We went back and forth and we were dealing with uh, German e-boats and, uh, and there's stories there that would, are far too long to try to be laid here today. There was e-boats and uh, all kinds of weather conditions. With the, these ships were, were very, um, well they were flat bottom so you got a very uh, rough ride with them, and uh, the sea off the English Channel can be a real uh, hectic time at times. Uh, anything else I can uh, give you? Um, yeah, um, what, were you, uh, what was your experience in battle, like fighting? Like, well actually we, we were manning our guns. We were on for anti-aircraft uh, uh, protection, but there was no there was only two planes, I had a German planes that actually made it over the beach on that day. So consequently we were working, we would do the, you know, the seaman type laborers or work that, that was required to do, handling lines and things like that on that day. So we, uh, fortunately, uh, we come back, we had a, a kind of a grandstand seat because I was on the, on the bow which was about 60 feet off the water and uh, had a pretty good command of everything that was going on. The, the big battleships, there was the Nevada, Pennsylvania and New York were all there and they were they were fighting. The noise was horrendous as, as these big battle wagons were bombarding the beach. And then in the afternoon of that day we were we upped anchor and we were back, which which gave us confidence that we weren't going to be pulling these people off the beach, which was considered at one point. Because it, the battle did not go that well on Omaha Beach. There was a lot of people lost there that day. I think there was something like nine thousand casualties on that beach alone. Casualties not necessarily killed. I think it was around 3,000 killed. I'm not sure the exact figures. I do have it in my briefcase. But I've been killed and wounded. Mm. So it was, a, it, it was a very rough day depending on where you were. I know you'll be interviewing some, or they will be interviewing some vets that really uh, have had a lot more horrendous experience in the in the hand to hand end. That's one advantage, advantage of the Navy. Normally you don't have to look the man in the eye that you're actually out there to destroy. Did have another experience uh, um, after, uh, have we got time for this? Yeah. Mm -hmm. There was another experience we had afterwards. We were making a run. They were, they were running low on ammunition. Patton, of course, had made a, an end run and gone down through the, uh, the southern part of France to come up into Germany that way. And he was running low on ammunition. So we were loaded with, uh, uh, I think that's in the, in the uh, log there, we're loaded with high explosives, gasoline and stuff that was very, very uh, uh, 
unstable and volatile. Mm -hmm. And there was three of us in the convoy. We had one PC, a patrol craft that was our escort. And the Channel Islands, you ever hear the Channel Islands? Mm -hmm. no. That's, they're, they're a British, uh, they're under British rule, but actually they should be French. You probably heard of Victor Hugo who wrote uh, uh, Hunchback of Notre Dame. It, most people know, well, that's where he's from. And that's the area that he wrote about a lot in Toilers of the Sea and The Laughing Man, different books that he wrote. And well, it was our, our job to come down, bring this load of ammunition down into Brittany, which is south of Normandy. And we uh, were coming down, and uh, we've always blamed it on the navigator, but we were in too close to the Channel Island of Guernsey. And the Germans had these huge coastal defense guns on there. We, we uh, estimated they were probably 16 inch. And we're out about 15 miles. And uh, we're just sailing along, you know, it's a beautiful day. You can just barely see the, see the uh, uh, land on the horizon. All of a sudden there's three spurts of smoke up there. And uh, that's reported and to the to con and immediately got general quarters. When you see the spurts of smoke, it took one and a half minutes for those shells to come out. And when they did, they come out and they bracketed the ship. They actually, one on one side, one on the other, and one here. And uh, I remember coming up onto the bow and the shrapnel, huge pieces of shrapnel were coming over the bow. One of the fellows picked one up and it was red hot, you know, from the explosion. Well, we were, we were uh, under fire from these guns until they dropped 36 rounds on, on our ship alone. The salvo in, in 36 rounds. Why, why they didn't hit? Because they were so close. But every time we'd get a salvo, the captain would give a command for another maneuver. And then we were moving out, which was dangerous too, because there was a minefield that was out, out of ways. So that probably was uh, the closest. If we'd ever got uh, hit with one of those shells with all that ammo aboard, it would have just been, it would have been like the World Trade Center, you know, just a big puff of smoke, and that would have been it. Um, do you have any other experiences that stand out? Yeah, I remember one night we were taking a load of uh, Sherman tanks over. Uh, for some reason or other, they weren't griped down or, or secured with uh, turnbuckles. They had place in the deck so that, you know, if you got to rolling, they wouldn't slide. Well, we were off the coast of France. We were hitting these huge ground swells. Maybe you've had experience with that. Uh, or heard about them anyway, how they, off the coast they have these. Well, when we did, as we grew up on one swell, all of these 30 tanks slid maybe five or six feet to the side of the ship. And then they would, all this tonnage was banging on the side of the ship. And when, when she would go over, she would roll, and then she'd just shudder along like this because you know, all your weight was off the center. And, and then eventually the swell would bring it back, and then this whole thing would, bang back across the other side. Well, we were very, very uh, concerned that uh, they were going to get up enough force right out through the side of the ship. Uh, fortunately, they didn't. Uh, I know we were down there, and I, I realize as I look back now, of course, at, at 18, you don't have the same kind of considerations, you know. <laughs> it some crazy things, uh, you know. <laughs> and, and we were running around on these things, trying to get some kind of a line on them that would secure them. Uh, we never did, but we finally got into smooth enough water, and we're, we, we come in to the beach, and at that time we were <coughs> loading on the beach. We were right up on the beach and dropping around. We had a real angle all the way in at that time, so that was an interesting experience. <clears throat> what was the most uh, interesting or inspiring thing you experienced during your service? Interesting. Well, I had 21 days leave in, in five day segments while I was over there that were, were a lot of fun. You had to meet a lot of people and enjoy the, the, the Brits who went through a lot more than we did. You know, they went for, for 1941, they were under the Blitz and, and they, they lost their, all of their equipment on, on Dunkirk, at the Battle of Dunkirk. Uh, amazing thing happened there when they when they were bring, able to bring 350,000 men off of there in these little boats and and an even uh, more miraculous thing was that the English Channel was quiet for seven days while they did it. Normally the English Channel is a very rough stretch of water, and they they were able to extract 
all of these men. They had no equipment, but they were able to extract the men and to uh, bring them uh, back, and they became the nucleus for, for their land army there. But some of the people that were uh, actually uh, patrolling the, the uh, shoreline there, you know, the, the coast, because they thought the Germans were going to mount an attack right away, and if they had it, they probably would have overwhelmed Britain. And then the, so the war would have been an entirely different story. But they were down to one shell, maybe, or even just a pitchfork or whatever, you know. It was, mm -hmm. it, it was a, I have a lot of respect for the, the British in that, in that area. So uh, th those were interesting times, getting to know the people. I've had the opportunity since then. I have a daughter that lives in the Shetland Islands. That's up west of Norway, 180 miles west of Norway, north of Scotland. And uh, I have the opportunity to get over just about every year. So I've had the had a really a lot of nice experiences that way. And it makes you much more cosmopolitan if you, if you get a chance to travel like that. Because things are, even now, are different because of the, the recent history here in the United States. Um, what was it like coming home after the war? That was um, an experience. We brought the ship back, uh, across the Atlantic with it. Uh, now we cross the Atlantic in five and a half hours in a, in a, in a jumbo jet. It took us three weeks, 21 days. And 17 days of that, uh, you couldn't even land your bunk. It was so rough. As I said, these ships were very, very rough riding because of the fact they were flat bottomed. And when we saw the coast, we came into Hampton Roads down in, uh, down in Norfolk, Virginia. And it was great to, to see the United States and be back and, you know, just be on land and not have to worry about uh, the, the sh ship breaking up under you. Which is another story. These did have a habit of bending in the middle until they until they started to crack because they were 325 feet long and, and they were just welded. They were you know, what quarter inch uh, plate welded together. So it was really uh, quite an experience to get back. And of course, it was nice to be home. We had 30 days uh, rehabilitation leave, and then I went back down to Little Creek, uh, Virginia, which is the advanced uh, amphibious base, and I stayed there till. August. I worked down there as uh, uh, run one of the wings of the mess hall down there as a master at arm. And then when the, when the uh, bomb was dropped, we were allowed to, uh, we were allowed to get out on points. You had so many points, you it determined the date that you get out. So I got out quite quickly then. Um. If, is there anything, like if you can go back, anything you would have changed in the war? In the war? That you've done? You mean during, since the war? Yeah. Or, or, or well, like right. during the war, like joining? Uh, you know, join if you... Well, I, I have a different view of uh, <laughs> killing people today. Uh, killing can be, a, you know, normally, like even the German army or of course, it's a, it's a different situation. Most of these things are, are cultural, these things we get into today. You know, we're, we're, uh, we feel we're right against the uh, uh, Afghans, and I, and I believe we're right, don't get me wrong, but, but they believe they're right just as much as we believe we're right. And there's a lot of people, civilians, as you know, get caught up in these, these confrontations. It's nothing new to have uh, civilians killed, and uh, that happens, that's war. And whether this country would be willing to accept that, I, I don't know. Uh, there, it's there's a changed feeling in the country today. I think I think maybe you have a different concept of that than I would have at this point, because you see it view it from a different perspective. I mean, you're looking forward in your life, and you're you're really interested in how this is going to affect you. I'm sure. And. Uh, I, I, the only advice, i give you a little advice, would be that you find something that you really like to do. Uh, I mean, don't get caught up in a job that you go, you earn your wages, and you, you dread it every day. But if you can find something you really like to do, like interviewing old guys like me, or, or whatever it happens to be, that, where, you, where you really look forward, that's, that's what it takes. I spent 27 years carrying mail, and uh, after a while that isn't very challenging. 
and you get caught in the system and then you, you can't really break away from it because your pensions and everything are not. But there are advantages to that. I've been retired for 21 years too. So I've uh, been able to do a lot of things since then. I had the time to do it. I also uh, just like to make a comment in passing here. That, uh, I had two brothers. Um, my oldest brother went in, he enlisted on December 7, 1941. Uh, number, the next day, he just, it's December 8th, he enlisted right after Pearl Harbor. And he was caught up, he was in the Air Force as a, as a flight engineer in a, in a troop carrier group, went through all through the African campaigns, up the Italian peninsula into Albania, Yugoslavia. And he, uh, he survived, died here uh, oh, about uh, five years ago. I had another brother who was uh, in the uh, Donovan's uh, Raiders, the uh, Office of Strategic Services, which became the CIA. He jumped into uh, Thailand behind the uh, lines uh, to teach the Thais, uh, the resistance, Japanese resistance, how to use American weapons. There was a team of six of them. So he had a lot of experiences, too, that I, it would have just been nice if, if, if we could have done this earlier, because we're losing so many people so quickly now. Anything else I can tell you? Um, any other experiences you want to talk about? War experiences? Mm -hmm. No, I think we've pretty well covered it. Um, I've got some pretty extensive, I've done quite a bit of extensive um, uh, study of, of the historical parts of this. There's several books that I could recommend anybody that would uh, be watching this tape. Um, one is, let me, let me just get it out here. Okay. This book was written by a, a Brit in about 1955, I believe. Um, well, I think it was around 55, so it's a fairly fresh perspective on, on the invasion, and it covers all of the beaches at, at Normandy. And he covers Omaha, Sword, Juneau, Gold, and Utah. And he does a very, very good job. And he, uh, like uh, Mr. Stephen Ambrose, you probably heard of his biography of D-Day, that, that's an excellent book too. And uh, I think that probably, I, I do have this book, The Story of D-Day, this is probably a children's book. This is the one that I was referring to earlier, uh, and this uh, speaks of the uh, of the uh, the uh, ship, the ducks sinking, and the Shuford and the chief. It's is the paragraph in here, and the Shuford was what they called their gun, 105 millimeter howitzer, and it, and it uh, just to quote a little bit here. This, this, I, I mentioned the weight uh, of the howitzer by itself. See, the choppy four-foot waves slapping against your sides were slashing da a dangerous amount of water aboard. The weight of the howitzer by itself was considerable, and in addition, the duck was carrying 13 ar artillerymen. Fifty shells and other equipment a gun crew uses, a radio, telephone, wire, picks, and shovels, a camouflage net with its 12 support poles, sandbags, K-rations, which you know are concentrated food, and the cannoneers' knapsacks called musette bags filled with their personal belongings. Two of the 13 ducks sank minutes after they were launched. Those are the ones that I referred to before. One of them caught by the current was washed back against our ship's ramp and crashed heavily against it and went down like a stone. And then uh, we were able to pick them up. The cannoneers and their inflated life belts were picked up, but the howitzers were gone forever. See, that's the heavy equipment. I did have, you won't go into that because that could go all morning, but those are really interesting um, uh, excerpts there. Uh, I was in Weymouth where, uh, let's see, was it last year? Yes, last year, and I met a fellow that's uh, in a diving club there, and he has been diving on some of the old wrecks from our ships. And one of the ships that led us in, the convoy that we followed in on D-Day, the 314, was, was sunk, um, I think it was on Christmas, around Christmas time in, in 44. There was two of them sunk in, uh, by e-boats in the convoy. I thought that was interesting. 
and he was able to go down and actually look at some of these ships uh, that are down there on the bottom yet. What exactly are e-boats? An e-boat is it would be uh, like a PT boat. You know what a PT boat is? Not Not exactly. boat? They're a high speed. Uh, the American version would be I don't know the exact uh, uh, specifications on an e-boat, but it's similar to a PT, which had two 2,000 horsepower Allison engines, and then they had torpedoes on the side. They moved 50 to 55 knots, so they would go in very quickly and and throw their torpedoes and and then right out again. So you, you may you may be in a convoy. We did what seven knots was our convoy. You know that's about eight or nine miles an hour. So these things come in and uh, um, these these ships that were sunk, they they drop, put three torpedoes in them so quick that they 30, 40 seconds they're they're going down. Hmm. So that uh, that was the I think that worked on the nerves more than anything was the actual follow up more than the invasion because the invasion was. We were in a relatively quiet and safe spot, but it was a follow-up action that was became difficult for us. And uh, well, I do recall one incident too, as long as we got a little more time here. Uh, one night we're coming back in a, in a very, very heavy fog, and I was on bow watch. That's right, right in the front, and it's about two, three hundred feet back to the to the bridge. Well, from you know heavy fog, you can hardly see the bridge. And all around us, we can, we're sailing like maybe 10 or 12 ships in this convoy, and all of a sudden we hear all these klaxon horns going off. You know, they go whoop, 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 like that. You've heard them maybe in some of the movies. And all around us, and the, <laughs> we met, we're going into a convoy coming the other way. All of a sudden, this ship's right in front of us. And uh, <laughs> it was a real eerie. It was, you know, there was just kind of a glow there with the, with the uh, fog. And she's, kind of, she's bearing down on us, and... Uh, our, uh, I reported it to the to the conning tower, and they pulled the whistle two. That means two to starboard, and the other guy is one to port. Well, we started to turn to starboard, and he started to turn to port. But and we did we did miss the head down, but he caught us in the oh maybe three quarters of the way back, and uh, tore out one of the after after heads. A head is uh, the latrine or the bathroom, and uh, there was a quick exodus from there from the people who were in there, because they were sitting right out in the open after that went through. And uh, the anchor from the other ship ended up on one of our Davids. This, the 60 ton anchor was hanging on one of the Davids. And we're hooked to this other ship with this chain. Uh -huh. And right away somebody, I saw her really on their toes, they were up there with a acetylene torch and they cut that away in about five minutes and that meant another leave in, 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 uh, in Breton though, because they had to go in for repairs. So we weren't too disappointed with that. Uh -huh. <laughs> uh, do you but, have any experience with U-boats? No, not really. Uh, coming back, there's a, there's a place called the uh, Crossroads that between, comes up from Gibraltar and in southern England. And it's a place where the shipping moved. The Germans used to, the, the wolf packs used to kind of hang around there and see what they could pick off. Uh, the day after we went through there, uh, we, were, we were 12 ships, I believe, in a convoy. And uh, we had uh, three destroyers, and they they really pulled the destroyers off quickly there one day, and we could hear the depth charging in the distance, but we didn't have any actual experience with that. The channel is is rather confined. The e boats were the were the things. There was an incident uh, took place. I was involved in it, and that was uh, uh, strange because that was our flotilla that was taking part in it called Operation Tiger. Have you ever heard of that? Mm -mm. Well, there was an area in, in uh, southern England called Slapton Sands. Uh, that's another book, too, uh, that's uh, written by a guy by the name of Ken Small. There's an area there that resembled Utah Beach perfectly. And they, they cleared all the civilians out of that area for, I think it was 27 square miles, 24 square miles. And they, they use that for uh, exer live exercise. These live shells, that they were actually making the uh, simulated landings to prepare them. Well, three weeks before D-Day, there was, uh, I think it was eight ships. I may be wrong on these numbers, but mm -hmm. uh, I'm close anyway. We're all lined up. We had, they had one British escort, 
and that and, and the other one had to go back in for repairs. We were in for repairs or we would have been in this. But they, as they were going in, they were all lined up like ducks in a row. This German e-boat squadron come in, and it uh, took out three of these ships, all loaded with men. There were seven, eight hundred men on each one, and uh, 120 Navy on each one. And there was uh, 1,200 people, military, lost on that, in that one exercise. That's all documented in this uh, book, Operation Tiger. And, it, and it, this was all kept secret because they figured the, the, the morale would be affected because of the, this was three weeks before D-Day and, and uh, you know, you lose, you lose that many men in an exercise, what's going to happen on the beach, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, that was, they finally declassified that somewhere in the 70s, I think. I wasn't even aware of it. And then this, this fellow I was speaking of that wrote the book, his name's Ken Small. I bought a book and presented it to our, our ship's reunion uh, last time I was there. Uh, he he uh, went out and tried to uh, get recognition for all these people and set up this memorial. But what he did, they found a tank, one of these Sherman tanks that had sunk. It was a mile out to sea and, and it was in 60 feet of water and had been there for 40 years. And he managed to work back and forth with the American government with the British government they actually raised this tank. I wish I had brought it. I got a, I got a picture of it. They raised this tank, floated it in, brought it up on the beach, and, and it's set up there as a memorial. It's slapped in sands now. Very interesting thing to see. After 40 years in the water, they, they got it up to where they could tow it, and oil come out of the, out of the or grease come out of the grease fittings on the, on the trucks, and they still turned in salt water. It was incredible. Huh. But it sets over there as a memorial now to those 1,200 people that were, were that died on, on that uh, Operation Tiger. So, um, what do you think about what's going on today with uh, the war that's happening today? What do you, what are your views on that? What are my views? Yeah. Well, obviously, it's it's no longer a military war. Mm -hmm. It's a it, it, it's a dirty war. I don't know if there's such a thing as a clean war, but you know when, when you go to work in the morning and you got, I understand, 700 people in one office and it wipes out that whole office, that, that's, that's not good. We, we, either, we either take action or, or we, we uh, knuckle under to this. What it will what cost in people, I don't know. Uh, what, what kind of a situation we're going to have in Afghanistan when we get done. Whether we're replacing one evil with another evil or, you know, you probably have discussed this in your, your history classes. Uh, it's a different culture. You know, we, we're Judeo-Christian over here, the bulk of the people are over here, and it's different than, a, than the uh, Muslims. I'm not trying to make any judgments here because we're different than the Hindus or, the, or whatever, the Confucianists. <laughs> but well, as long as we have people hating people, and uh, I don't, I don't think I think we have a very difficult time understanding what people would have a difficult understanding the thinking of the people that are uh, involved in what's going on over there, or in or in the country for that matter. I mean, how could we possibly uh, think about coming and maybe working in a in an, uh, an office for for four years? Just to prepare to commit suicide, have your family and your school, you know, they're walking up and down the halls here with you. And then, and then uh, say, well, you're going back to wherever, and, uh, and I'll never see you again, and then fly an airplane into a building. What kind of a mindset does that take? Mm -hmm. okay. So my views are, uh, I guess, that uh, I think we're doing, what we're doing is probably right from the, from the perspective of the country. Looking at it from a physical uh, point of view, spiritually, I don't know. I, uh, it's hard, you know. Killing people is not something that I want to do anymore <laughs> or be involved in. And uh, I hope someday we can all be at peace because usually, a lot of times, you know, you could be you could be uh, uh, Hermann Schultz, you know, the German that I was fighting, and we're sitting here having this discussion. And, and when we get up, we're good friends, you know. <laughs> mm -hmm. And yet, yet you get out here, and uh, then you're supposed to kill this guy. Civil War is a good example of that, isn't it? 
<laughs> one one minute you're you're swapping uh, uh, tobacco or things across the river and and uh, having a good time, or e I even understand they had games across the river. The next thing you know, they're shooting at each other. It kind of boggles the mind, doesn't mm -hmm. it? Definitely does. Okay. What are your views? Um, I don't know. I'm not really sure about the war. I don't. I don't uh, really get into it that much. I think well, we're doing good, the right it's thing. It's good to know our history, though, and mm -hmm. I, it's good to see you, you people are, are involved in this. You know, as Santana said, he says, he who forgets his history is doomed to repeat it. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know the saying. So, I don't know how long we've been at this. It's been 40 minutes. We can. Yeah. Is there anything else you want to ask uh, us? Or? Any questions you have? That, uh, I, can... I think. I think we got it all covered. I mean, it's been, I've had an opportunity in uh, later years to, to do a lot of reading in history. Civil War, we have some, you know, we're so uh, uh, kind of saturated with history right in this area here, revolutionary history. You got the Battle of Oriskany. I would recommend there's a book out there, if you haven't read it, by Mr. Foote. Have you ever heard of it? Mm -mm. Battle of Oriskany, yeah. There was more people killed at the Battle of Oriskany any other battle Americans fought. Percentage-wise, there were 700 militia went in there under under Herkimer, and they were they were all casualties. Uh, there was 250 were all that survived. And you've got that right there. You can go down and sit on that battleground and, and uh, think about those. We had a fort here too, it's, though it wasn't. It was never involved in any battles here. It was under siege under Saint Ledger at the time. So you got a. a I, th I think it's something you have to cultivate a little bit. Uh, is this a class that you're doing here that uh, you get credit for? Mm -hmm. what, what do they call the class? World Wars. World Wars. That's the name Both, of the course. Right? Mm -hmm. Oh, that's interesting. That's the name of the course. I could tell you that my dad was in World War I, and he was in the Navy, and he was in the North Sea Mine Fleet on the USS Roanoke. They laid mines up in the North Sea. Because if uh, I don't know how how much of you have, you haven't interviewed many World War One veterans I don't mm -hmm. think <laughs> I don't think any <laughs> I don't think there's any around anymore <laughs> they'd, have to, they'd have to be at least a hundred years old or more mm -hmm. so <laughs> but there's a that seemed like a, to me it seemed like a very uh, long time ago when I was a, a kid and actually it wasn't mm -hmm. you know it was only twenty thirty years. Mm -hmm. But what what brings you to the point you're at? Uh, you know, you, you say, well, why did you go there? You you don't. You, I joined the navy. I didn't know where I was going. For every one that actually goes into combat, there's probably 50 that never see combat. And and I had no control over that. After I after I got in the service, my life was completely within the hands of the people that were were running the show. So you have to think of that. And the people that we see heroes are the ones that actually react at a certain time and point. But most of us who were there, we, we had no plans to, to be, we didn't even know what was going to happen really. In fact, I, I would kind of wanted to get into aviation mechanics, but that isn't what they needed at the time and they just packed us up. I actually had my training when I come back, the advanced training. I went over there and got all the training that I had to have for the, for the invasion, it was done aboard ship. Mm -hmm. Aircraft recognition and, uh, and how to handle your guns clean. We had 20 millimeter. We had 21 guns aboard. We had six or seven 40 millimeters, and I think there was the rest were 20 millimeter. If you're familiar with the with the air, anti aircraft weapons, probably not. No, nah, not really. <laughs> <laughs> That's another story too. Oh. So I can't think of anything more offhand. Okay. okay. Well, thank you very much. Yep.